don't you try it. Cabo Blanco is een godvergeten vissersdorpje aan de kust van Peru, waar Charles Bronson zich in vrijwillige afzondering heeft teruggetrokken. De ongezonde belangstelling van ex-nazi Jason Roberts voor een scheepswrak en het bezoek van de mooie Dominique Sandra maken een einde aan die afzondering. Cabo Blanco, onze vrijdagavondfilm op 18 maart op TV1. De nieuwste film van Michael Redford, de Engelse regisseur die reeds Another Time, Another Place en 1984 afleverde, kreeg als titel White Mischief en handelt over een groep Engelse kolonialen in Kenia aan het begin van de Tweede Wereldoorlog die hun tijd doorbrengen met veekweken en gokken op de paardenrennen en de verveling proberen te verdrijven met polowedstrijden en seksuele spelletjes. In dit milieu arriveert het pasgetrouwde paar Sir Broughton, 57 jaar, en zijn 30 jaar jongere vrouw Diana. Het duurt niet lang of Diana wordt verliefd op Jocelyn Errol Hay, de plaatselijke Don Juan. Broughton probeert met Engelse flegma zijn gezicht te redden, wat hem maar gedeeltelijk lukt. En dan wordt Jos op een nacht vermoord aangetroffen. Verdachten zijn er genoeg en een groots proces wordt opgezet waar verdachte nummer 1 Broughton tenslotte wordt vrijgesproken. Dit echt gebeurde verhaal wordt met brio vertolkt door Charles Dance, Greta Skaghi, Jos Eklund, John Hurt, Sarah Miles... Geraldine Chaplin en Trevor Howard. De intelligente regie is in handen van Michael Redford. Met hem, producer Simon Perry en acteur Josh Eklund, hadden we een uitgebreid gesprek. Mr. Perry, in the very early stage of this project, you were approached by Michael White. Uh, were you immediately enthusiastic about this proposal? Yes. Um, there were various stages of my response, I think. Um, Initially, I was very enthusiastic because I read the book by James Fox, and there are many commercial elements, if you like, in this story. It's a story about decadence taking place in Africa. Uh, it's exotic, and it had some wonderful characters in it. That was the first response. The second response, once Mike and Johnny Gems, the co-writer, started to write the script, was that it was actually going to be an enormous challenge because although on the face of it, it's a very attractive story, and it's full of fascinating people. When you start to look at those people, you realize they are deeply unsympathetic. And we began to worry quite a lot as to whether we could really make a film that would hold people's attention about such disgusting people. But I like the impossible, and so I responded very positively to the challenge that that set. And in fact, I, I remember that there was a crucial point where Mike was really losing faith in the project. And he was saying, I just don't know whether this is a film that I can make because who are these people? I mean, how do we make these people likable, interesting? And I said, a little strategically, I said, I think you're right. I think you're the wrong director for this film. I think you should forget all about it. I think we should find another director and you should concentrate on The Slow Train to Milan, which is our next project. And uh, I know Mike quite well. And uh, he said, yes, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, well, let me think about it for a few days. And I kind of waited. And uh, after a few days, he rang up and he said, so when do you think we should start shooting? Oh, my God. Alice Duchamp's here. What's she doing here? I didn't know she'd been allowed back into the country. She's one of the original Happy Valley crowd. They're supposed to get up to all sorts of things, especially during the rainy season. Joss is one of them, actually. Why wasn't she allowed back into the country? She shot her husband, Raymond. In Kenya? No. In the balls. <laughs> <laughs> Joss. 
Um, no, I don't know champagne. No. Joss. Jock, good God. <laughs> Do excuse me. Come and meet my wife. Catch up with me later, all right? Diana, I want you to meet one of the most amusing men in Africa, Joss Harrell. How do you do? Welcome to paradise. May I take your photograph? Well, of course, but whatever for. Uh, Jock insists I photograph anything that takes my fancy. <laughs> you know, I think that if you're if you're English and you and you. You've lived through the fall of the British Empire, if you like, or the change that's taken place. Then sooner or later, you have to address yourself to that problem. Um, psychologically, it's very important. But that's not the only thing the thing that the script was about. Uh, it's it's about the English character um, and a particular way of being in England, uh, which is that 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 the English people often find it very difficult to express their their emotions, or even to have real emotions, because they've had such, led often such miserable childhoods. <laughs> Uh, particularly people of that class, and um, it's uh, the psychological possibilities of that, plus the, the intri just the simple intrigue of this decadent society. Um, too difficult to resist. Yeah, and was it also the fact that it was a murder story as well? You know, the murder for me isn't so important. I mean, it's obviously the central event, but I'm I'm not convinced that there's much of a mystery myself and I haven't tried to elaborate on the mystery what I what I am concerned about is the fact that that what s series of events the killing actually um, set off where, where it, it pushed pushed uh, the situation on to much more extraordinary I think is the fact that having been acquitted um, Broughton one of the central characters played by Joss Ackland um, buys the, the house of the man who has been murdered, his wife's lover, and goes to live there with her. I mean, what kind of mind is, is conceiving uh, sort of an act like that? I mean, for me, that's interesting. Yeah. Diana? Come and sit on the bed. I'm very proud of you, you know. Everybody was frightfully impressed. Were they? Did you have an enjoyable time? I'm very sleepy, Jock. Would you? You don't mind, do you? No, of course not. Turn around, darling. Let me look at you. It took a long time to write the script. It's a very difficult script to write. I don't know why exactly, but it was. And so I went to Kenya first in 1985, after, just after I'd finished 1984, the film, rather. Yes. <laughs> um, and I went there and did a lot of research into the background material from the book and then proceeded to try and construct with my co-screenwriter, Jonathan Jones, a story, because the book doesn't really have a story apart from the story of the investigation into the murder, and that's not the story of the film. So it was really an original screenplay, if you like, taken from a set of facts which you, which you find in the book. But a lot of research. Mm. And then you actually uh, filmed on location in, in Kenya. Uh, was that hard? But it is hard, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 it's hard, it's difficult, um, it's dusty. Um, transportation, communication is very, very difficult. Um, and Africa is, you know, the African way of life is not, is not particularly geared up to making the pressures of making films, different rhythm. Um, so that all creates difficulties. But actually it's very rewarding as well because, because it is very beautiful and you get sucked into the, into the atmosphere of the place. It's really extraordinary. When you were filming in, Ke in Kenya, have you met people there who had actually known the real characters? Oh, yes. Yes? Yes. There's plenty of them. Um, there are several people who were alive at the time of the murder. Um, all of those I met. Um, James Fox, you see, having researched the book so carefully, he was a very useful source of contacts. And when Mike and Johnny went there first to start getting a bit of a feel of the atmosphere, 
uh, they met a lot of the people. Not really in pursuit of the facts of the case, because we were never really that interested in the facts. I mean, we wanted to tell a true story, but not necessarily an absolutely factual story. But the British way of life in Kenya or Kenya is so specific that you have to meet those people to, to understand how the people in this story should behave and talk. So in that way, it was extremely useful. It's also very confusing because all the people who knew any of the people in the story or who were alive at the time or who were relatives of the people involved in the story, they all have different theories. They all have different theories about who killed Lord Errol. Yes. And after a time, you have to stop talking to them because they've all got something to say which sounds plausible, but at the same time, they none of them agree with each other, so it's a nightmare. <laughs> and we just had to start being polite and social, but to stop being investigative about it, because we had to tell our own story in our own way. Diana? Jock, what are you doing here? You said you'd be back for dinner. Did I? No, I'm sorry, I think you've got it wrong. I said I was going out. You said you'd be back for dinner. Please, Jock, don't make a scene. I'm going home. Are you coming? No, it's too early. When will you be finished? I'll send Luali to pick you up. No. I'll stay at the club tonight. The club? Why? I don't know how late I'll be. Is Errol here? Yes, I think so. Jock. Hello, Jock. How are you? Would you bring Diana home tonight? Well, yes, if she wants me to. As a friend, Joss, bring her home. Have you asked her? I'm asking you. Ah. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry, John. Can't do that. Why not? Because she's spending the night with me. Uh, you have an impressive cast for hmm. this movie. Uh, how hard was that to bring them all together? That was very easy, yeah. actually. Yeah. That was very easy because they all loved the script. And even before we started making the film, there was all kinds of talk in the industry and also even publicity in the newspapers about the fact that this subject was going to be made into a film. Because in, in England, this is quite a celebrated subject. Yeah. And the script was good. And actors felt this was a project that they should be involved in. I mean, people often ask, why did Geraldine Chaplin agree to do such a tiny part? Why did Trevor Howard agree to appear in such a tiny part? Well, to take Geraldine as an example, um, she read the script, which we sent to her, rather cheekily, really, um, because Geraldine is a, a kind of a world star. And we said, would you like to play this part? You'll find part of it on page 22 and the other bit on page 146. And there's another line on page 153. Yeah. To our great surprise, she, she came back and said she thought it was one of the best scripts she'd ever read, and that she just wanted to be involved with the project. So we were very lucky in that way. I mean, Johnny and Mike did a wonderful job with the script, but we were lucky too. It had a good feeling about it, this project. Yeah. Well, I was fascinated by the story, even when I was a kid, I, when I, during the war, when everything was at its worst. Uh, this story, was uh, the, when the trial happened, it was quite big news, despite the fact that the war was going on. And I was always fascinated by this group of really decadent people. And so, some years later, I was, I, many years later, I was a tea planter in Central Africa. And um, we were miles, my wife and I, with our two kids, were miles from anywhere, working as very hard-working planters. But even there, where we were, with a, uh, the story wafted through the bushes and the echoes were still there, the reverberations. And so um, when I heard that James Fox had written a book about it, uh, we, we read it and um, I loved the book because it was an enormous bestseller.
In the film, it was an era of decadence and sexual debauchery. Um, yet you chose to bring this to the screen in a rather delicate way. Uh, why was that? Well, I'm not. I'm. You know. I mean. I think that the film, the film ha is erotic rather than, s you know, sexy. Uh, I'm not. I'm not f fantastically c keen on on kind of showing sexual acts on the screen unless they have a meaning. And um, what I wanted was to give it, to give an atmosphere of, 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 of eroticism. I mean, I think that having been said, there are a couple of things in the movie which you've never seen before, <laughs> notably in, including Sarah Miles. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for me, that's, the, that's typical, if you like, the act that she performs in The Mortuary is typical of the kind of sexual act because it's a desperate m moment and there was something desperate and vulnerable about these people as well as amusing. You get quite a shock when you see Charles dance in, in women's clothes, I must say. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm surprised by that, actually. There's a, there's, you know, they, they, the, the actors hated doing it. Uh, they complained bitterly. And uh, they said that they looked, one, look, looked ridiculous and the women looked wonderful. And um, they complained so much, actually, that when I came to shoot the second half of the scene in England, without telling them, I got the entire crew, all 150 of us, to dress up in women's clothes and the girls to dress up in men's clothes. And they came act without telling the actors. They all came down onto the floor of the studio and were completely floored <laughs> by it. It was quite funny because it was true, you see. The girls looked wonderful and we looked ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Although I had a very nice blue dress, which is quite nice. <laughs> we wore it all day as well. We didn't just, not just for a joke, we did it all day. <laughs> you know, they used to be saying in Happy Valley, what happens to a girl when she loses her looks? answer nothing. Oh, Joss. What happens when you've bought and sold yourself so many times and there's nothing left? We thought we had everything and we have nothing. And if you were to ask, I don't believe any one of us could tell you why. I told you this is paradise. Well, it isn't. Sometimes I think Gilbert Colville's the only one who's found a way of living with it. Why me? I want you for my sake, Diana. I'm being entirely selfish. I want you more than I've ever wanted anyone in my rather shoddy life. I want you to save me from myself. I also read that, uh, that Greta Skahi was amazed that you allowed cooperation. Uh, is that so uh, rare? I think people, yes, I think a lot of people are afraid of actors. Uh, a lot of directors, uh, film directors particularly, um, they, they, they tend to, to be much, much more at home with the camera and, and all the rest of it and find the actors a little hard to deal with. I, I'm not afraid of actors. Um, I learnt my trade with Richard Burton and, and John Hurt and other people. And so I always feel that, that, um, that to impress or to try and uh, blinker an actor to, to absolutely your vision um, gives them, is not using them to their full extent. So um, I, I like to, to, to go along and to feel what their ideas are. Obviously I have an overall view myself. But that changes, you know, when, when once, the, once there's a person in front of you as opposed to just something that's written, that has to change. No person is ever exactly as you've written it. How was it to work with uh, Michael Redford? Well, I find it, I find it, I mean, at the time, there were bound to be ups and downs. And he was, um, the trouble was, really, was that we're both Pisces. <laughs> and we're both, so that we're both going in the different directions at the same time. And so he would say, how was that? And I'd say, it was fine. Was it? And he would say, no, I'm not sure. Well, what do you... And, <laughs> and this was... But it was a great relationship. And I do think he's, he's kept a very... For all that, going in two directions at the same time, he kept a very firm line with what he wanted to do. And I think... I mean, I, when I saw the movie the first time, it was, when I, like, it was similar to when I saw The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie for the first time. Because it's taking a new tack. There is no no one for the audience really to strongly identify with this, which is the normal rule in yeah. the cinema, so that they become Clint Eastwood or they become, you know, Meryl Streep or whatever. <laughs> you know, yes, God help us. Anyway, <laughs> and, um, 
and there have been far too many Rambos. It's about time we got rid of those. Things. And um, and so it is. So people are watching from the outside in a strange way. But he did it with such a strong light, and I find it. I found it very, and I think he's done it in such a way that it is now a complete film, and there aren't many of those. And I've seen it now four times. And normally, after a movie, I must confess, I do fall asleep possibly the second time. But with this, it gets more interesting each time I've seen it. Eveneens aandacht in filmspot voor het tweede werk van Lili Rademakers na Munuet, namelijk Diary of a Mad Old Man. Hierin gaat het over de seksuele obsessie van een oude man die zijn einde voelt naderen. Meneer Hamering, zo heet hij, een gewezen bankdirecteur, is verliefd op zijn inwonende schoondochter en cultiveert hierbij een doorgedreven vorm van voetfetischisme, wat aanleiding geeft tot tragicomische en soms zielige toestanden. Dit gegeven komt uit de gelijknamige roman van de Japaner Yonichiro Tanizaki, en werd door Hugo Claus tot een script bewerkt dat zich in Vlaanderen afspeelt. Voor de rolverdeling heeft mevrouw Rademakers internationaal gedacht, met namen als Ralph Michael, Beatty Edney, Suzanne Flon, Derek de Lint en Dora van der Groen. Diary of a Mad Old Man is een beetje onderkoeld verfilmd, niet tegenstaande zijn erotisch geladen inhoud. I thought we ordered tiles. They don't use tiles anymore. And it's not the turquoise I had in mind. It's exactly the shade he picked out. Of course, the swimming pool's a nice thing to have. And Pascal will love it. But it's such a waste of money. Well, it seems to give Father a lot of pleasure. What does he know about my pleasure? My only pleasure will be to see her... ever... in the swimming pool. Soon. Before I die. Lady Rademakers, how did you actually in contact with the roman of Tanizaki? Ik uh, kende zijn andere, of een van zijn andere romans, de sleutel, kende ik al ja. langer. En uh, uh, daar was ik zeer in geïnteresseerd. Totdat ik in de krant las dat er een Nederlandse vertaling was van de, dit boek. En dat ben ik onmiddellijk gaan kopen. En ik vond het eigenlijk nog mooier om te verfilmen. En dat was maar gelukkig ook, want ondertussen werd de sleutel al verfilmd door, ja. een, uh, door een Italiaans-Engelse koproductie. Ja. En wat trok u daar eigenlijk zo speciaal in aan in de roman? Uh, dat is uh, toch wel de erotiek uh, in, uh, die uh, ontstaat in uh, de confrontatie met de uh, dood eigenlijk. He makes you look like a very distinguished coffee planter. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Where's your collar? I decided never to wear it again. But doesn't your back hurt without it? Of course it does. seem to attract me, even when I'm in pain. There is ook sprake, laten we zeggen, van van fetishisme, in voet uh, fetishisme in dit geval, uh, vreedheid ook, die misschien ergens typisch Japans is. Um, hoe heb je dat kunnen vertalen in in uw uh, in onze omstandigheden? Uh, ik denk niet dat het zo typisch Japans is eigenlijk. Ik denk dat wij dat dat denken, maar dat het bij ons ook heel veel voorkomt, dit soort dingen. Want uh, de auteur uh, Yunikiro Tanizaki heeft ook niet voor niets uh, Freud veel bestudeerd. Hij was zeer uh, onder invloed van de West-Europese cultuur uit, het, uh, ja, zo uit de jaren 30, uh, 40. En, uh, uh, dus ik denk dat hij, voor Japan was hij weer heel bijzonder, wat, uh, hoe hij de erotiek bracht. Want ik geloof dat het in in Japan meer een soort hygiënische maatregel is de bedrijven van de erotiek en niet iets met, uh, met een soort uh, uh, opwinding ook in het gedachtenleven uh, gepaard gaat. En, uh, dus ik denk dat het ook voor Europa heel, uh, heel acceptabel is juist. Kom in. Ah. 
Tom, you expect to be happy? Today you may kiss my leg. Je hebt in het Engels gefilmd, dus je dacht ook al direct internationaal, mag ik wel zeggen. Ja, dat klinkt zo uh, presumptueus, maar uh, toch liefst wel natuurlijk. Want uh, het is een film voor een, uh, een, uh, een publiek dat geïnteresseerd is. En ik hoop daar natuurlijk in andere landen ook zo'n publiek te vinden. U hebt in die zin ook in de rolverdeling bijvoorbeeld mensen als Ralph Michael. Hebt u die gemakkelijk kunnen overtuigen om de hoofdrol te spelen? Um, ja, dat, uh, hij heeft dus wel gezegd dat hij het wilde doen zonder dat ik hem hoefde te overtuigen. Maar het heeft wel even geduurd voordat ik antwoord van hem kreeg. Want uh, eerst toen hij ervan hoorde, zei hij, oh, I've been waiting all my life uh, om, om zo'n absolute ja. hoofdrol te krijgen. Maar hij was natuurlijk toch een beetje gechoqueerd door het onderwerp. Want alle Engelsen zijn heel preuts, geloof ik. En uh, hij dus ook. Het is sedert 82 geleden dat u Minne Wet uh, draaide. Het is een vrij lange periode dus tussen uw eerste film en deze. Is dat voor u een opgelegd ritme? Een opgelegd ritme door uzelf of door omstandigheden? Um, dat is een beetje de omstandigheden. Het heeft nogal getraineerd deze film. Omdat ik, uh, het lang duurde voordat we de rechten uh, antwoord kregen. En voordat het helemaal geregeld was. Een ingewikkelde constructie. Omdat het... Uh, toch uh, een, een, een productie van kleine landen is eigenlijk. En uh, bovendien uh, uh, had ik ook nog wat uh, met de commissie die me nog eens een paar keer teruggestuurd heeft. En zo. Maar dat is allemaal goed gekomen. Maar aan de andere kant denk ik ook niet, er zijn tegenwoordig zoveel filmers in onze landen die graag uh, uh, subsidie willen hebben voor de films. Ik denk niet dat je ieder jaar kunt aankomen voor uh, een nieuwe subsidie. Andere mensen moeten ook eens aan de beurt komen. <lacht> dus wat dat betreft uh, is het natuurlijk ook een, uh, een... Als je niet hevig commerciële films maakt die vanzelf het geld terugbrengen, dan moet je daar ook een beetje rekening mee houden.